Hello, my name is Gerald Bolena and welcome to my guide to night and astro landscape photography. Well, as opposed to daytime photography, night photography has a number of criteria and challenges that are unique to the genre. Now, I thought long and hard as to what level to pitch this at in terms of your experience with photography in general, and I've decided to pitch it more to those of you who are at more of a beginner stage or maybe at a more advanced intermediate level, but have never tried night or astrophotography, but are maybe thinking it's something you might like to try. Now in this video, I'll be covering a number of topics related to what you'll optimally need and certain approaches and techniques you can use to best prepare yourself before shooting. I'll be covering such topics as shot planning, including weather and moon phases, how to find dark skies as far away from light pollution as possible, some useful apps and some additional gear and accessories that would be of value, through to optimal lenses, how to focus in the dark and also an approach to image composition in the dark. I will then share with you my complete post-processing workflow with a selected image. So let's dive in and start with planning. There are two important criteria you have to kind of get your head around um, before setting out and planning your astrophotography. First of all, and quite obviously, is the weather. So what I tend to do is use the weather channel and for whichever area I'm planning on going to shoot, uh, for example here it's my hometown of Ellenville, I always constantly check throughout the day the hourly projections and as you can see here on March 14th it's not looking good. Uh, the hourly projections are calling for mostly cloudy then around 11 p.m. onwards showers with a 40% chance. So I can quite quickly and easily see that this wouldn't be a particularly good night to go out. Scrolling further down there are two other key important pieces of information First of all, the sunrise, sunset, but most importantly is the moonrise and moonset. And this is something uh, very important to keep an eye on, both in terms of what the moonrise and the moonset times are. Because any moon in the sky, whether it be a half moon, or certainly a full moon, or even you know a quarter moon, is going to kick out a tremendous amount of ambient light. And certainly at a half moon stage or a full moon stage, you're pretty much going to see next to nothing in terms of... Um, stars in the night sky. There are also other websites out there that focus particularly on moon phases which can be also very useful in helping gauge this and this is one particular site and I'll put the link in the show notes and what you can see it actually gives you a visual reference of what the moon phases are going to be throughout any given period of time. So today March 14th we're looking at a waxing gibbous 51% visible set time 2.05 a.m. rise time 11.57 a.m. so that's not really going to give me a um, particularly long window whereby it wouldn't be visible in the night sky. So what you can do is begin to scroll through into the future and what you're really kind of looking for is a correlation between the moon phase and its rise and set time. So looking late March, kind of March into early April, this is kind of the area that you're going to want to be focusing on because even here Saturday 30th of March, you see the, the moon doesn't even rise to around about 4am but it sets at 1.57 early in the afternoon. So that's going to give you pretty much a full night of uh, astrophotography available. But I think optimally what you're probably going to be wanting to shoot for is this kind of phase here when it's a waning crescent, 8% visible, rises at 5.43 a.m. and sets at just around about 5 p.m. That's going to give you, a, say, a full night of astro shooting. And then here on Thursday, April 4th, um, you have the new moon and that is where it's not going to be visible at all in the sky. So sort of like, you know, this kind of week here, these few days when it's in this, this minimal phases or no phase whatsoever on Thursday, Thursday, April 4th, and even on Saturday, April 6th, it's 1% uh, visible, and that's my birthday, so I think I may go out and do some astrophotography. Now, my favourite go-to uh, app or desktop application is the Photographer's Ephemeris, and this is very popular amongst photographers in order to accurately plan your location in relation to where the sun and or moon will be at any given time during the day in terms of its visibility and position in the sky. It's very easy to use. It integrates with Google Maps. You have a couple of different ways that you can view it, uh, as you would do on Google Maps, either in satellite mode 
or just in straight regular roadmap mode. Now what this allows you to do by clicking on this icon up here, it will drop a mapping pin onto the map. By default, it places it into the center of the map. And from there, just by clicking and holding on that pin, you can move it to wherever you wish on the map to your location. Now I know that I was going to be shooting there. And this now gives me an instant visual reference on the position and angle of where the sun will be rising into relationship to where I am, and also the moon, and also where the moon will be setting, and also in what direction and position the sun will be setting later in the day. Now up here, you simply need to just click on this little clock icon, and it'll switch to the exact time and date of when you're viewing this. It also gives you a bunch of information down here, uh, the actual moon rise uh, time, the moon set time, the sunrise time, and the sunset time. Now by clicking and dragging on this slider here, let's just go back to before the sun rises. You can drag this either to the left or to the right. And by dragging to the right, you'll begin to see where and when the sun will be rising uh, visually. When I hit here, uh, that circle indicates that's when it will be official sunrise. And then it's just the case of moving it forward to see at whatever given time where the sun will be and at what angle it will be. It also gives you the ability to move forward in time to different days. And with a single click of the forward button up here, you can move forward by a day. And you will be able to see it on any given time or day, the uh, position and angle of the sunrise and the sunset, the moonrise and moonset, etc. Now I shoot up here a lot, and so I'm very familiar with this area. But if I wasn't, it's a very easy way to be able to uh, look for things such as possibly roads and or houses nearby. And by familiarizing oneself with that, you could then also gauge an understanding of whether or not there would possibly be any cars uh, available, uh, either moving towards you or away from you with their, with their headlights on, uh, that you could also use in order to track and lock autofocus on. And the same thing, as I can see here, yeah, there, there are a few houses around here that uh, may have their lights on at night that you could also use as a light source with which to autofocus. Once you've um, established your location, you can simply bookmark it and then have, create yourself a, a fairly comprehensive list of all the places you know that you want to go and shoot. And just by simply um, clicking on these little map icons, it'll take you straight to that location. And then you be can, can begin to assess again where the uh, sunrise and sunset will be taking place and at what angle and also the moonrise and moonset. So that's the Photographer's Ephemeris. Um, as I say, it comes as a desktop. It is free, but you are given the opportunity to be able to donate uh, towards its upkeep and development, which is something I strongly recommend you do. It also comes as an app for both uh, iOS and Android. And it comes in two versions, which is kind of the basic one. And then this slightly newer version, which is the Photographer's Ephemeris 3D, which gives you kind of more of an augmented reality view of uh, any given locations. Now, this 3D version here starts to edge it closer to another very popular app that's available um, on the market right now. And that's the Photo Pills app. Now, by comparison to the basic uh, Photographer's Ephemeris uh, app, it's it's very, very, very robust and I think can be a little bit complicated to kind of figure out, you know, how to use it. But that's no problem. If you go to the site and click on the Academy link, uh, you will see that they have a, a good selection of very helpful and useful tutorial videos on how to use certain features, how to set it up from scratch and your settings and all that kind of good stuff. So it, there is a lot of information on hand on how to use this particular app. But for me, nine times out of 10, the photographer's ephemeris does just fine. The other very important thing that one has to ascertain is because as we unfortunately know, we now live in a world of very prevalent light pollution is where the darkest areas in any given area are. There are a number of apps out there and there's also a desktop tool that is very useful to get you on the right track. And this is a site called darksitefinder.com. And again, I'll put the uh, link in the show notes. And this is basically what it gives you. It's almost like a thermal imaging map of luminance values throughout the night sky. 
and it comes complete with a little info sheet here. And this is your bright to dark scale in terms of color coding. And as you can see, like, you know, black here, which I've got to think has got to be out of space, down through kind of different varying degrees of darkness. And what you can do is you can use this locator point to uh, find your location. And this is where I am in good old downtown Ellenville. It's not exactly great, not a particularly great area as far as light pollution goes. There is one fairly dark spot up here, fairly close to home, and this is up at the Papactum Reservoir. And again, you know, this is what you're looking for when you're looking at this side, these darker blues or dark greys. So that's one way of doing it by using this particular site. But as you probably would have guessed, yes, there are some apps for that. And uh, this is the other one that I use, which is really terrific. It's called Dark Sky Finder. And again, it's also very, very simple to use. I mean, it basically is almost like that de desktop replication. It's basically a almost like a luminance thermal map of uh, luminance values over any given particular area. But what's really great is it's also, um, there is also a big community that contribute to it. And you can see in this particular screenshot, all these little red uh, map pins are actually live spots that you can tap on and it'll bring up the location. It'll bring up uh, a lot of information about it uh, that people have put in and it'll also give you direction so you can drive straight to it. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not in any way, shape or form uh, call myself an astronomy buff. Um, I, yeah, I'm not too bad at finding the moon, but uh, that's pretty much it. And I think I know where what Orion looks like and the Big Dipper. But outside of that, you know, it is quite a bit of a mystery to me and may well be to you. But again, as per usual, there are a couple of apps on hand that can be uh, very, very useful in understanding what is actually up above you or sometimes even down below you waiting to come up from the horizon. And two apps that I use is Sky Guide, and it's a terrific app. It uh, gives you in real time uh, exactly uh, where you are and what constellations, what stars, what planets are up above and floating around. And very similar is the app called Stellarium. But uh, they're both good and both very, very useful. Again, if you're, if you're not that particularly au fait with the night sky, this is uh, going to be a pretty invaluable tool for you. For location scouting and reconning, the app I use is Theodolite. This for me has been invaluable. It costs $6 and is available for both iPhone and Android. Now I use this a lot, particularly if I just happen to be driving around and pass somewhere that looks interesting in a pretty remote and or unfamiliar area, or if I'm out on a hike. Theodolite works in conjunction with your phone's camera and couldn't be more simple to use. Upon launching the app, it will allow you to take a shot of where you are and all one needs to do is tap the mail button and it takes a shot and automatically loads it into an email that you can then send to yourself. So later on when I'm back, it's just a question of opening the email. Contained within it will be the shot and a bunch of information. And it will also create links that you can either tap or click on to open the mapping or navigation app of your choosing. Either Gaia GPS, Apple Maps, or whatever the Android equivalent is, and Google Maps. It also sends a .kml file for Google Earth. I usually just use Google Maps and once it's open it will show you the exact location of where you took your shot and you can then get directions from where you are and can see how long it will take you to get there, etc. Now in terms of a few bits of gear that I've uh, acquired over the years that uh, has also proved to be very useful in the field. First of all is obviously a headlamp. Well, that goes without saying because obviously fumbling around in the dark is not anything you're really going to want to do. But with that, a tip I would give you is if you are, or you have a headlight or you're looking for a headlight, get one that gives you the ability to go from white light to red light. Having red, the red light on is going to give you enough light to see what you're doing, but unlike white light, it's not going to give you that light blindness in so much as if you're futzing around with white light bouncing and reflecting off the back of your camera. When you come to turn it off, you're going to have that momentary kind of uh, light blindness, and it may take you a good few minutes for your eyes to readjust. Doing all that kind of stuff with the red light on, uh, as soon as you switch the light off, you're not going to have to wait for your eyes to readjust in the dark. So that's a very useful thing to be able to have. 
also I have with me at any given time is a pretty robust, powerful flashlight. Now, this taps into a subject that I'm going to be covering later, and that's to do with how to focus in the dark if you've arrived after sunset and you've got to basically do everything in the dark. Having a very, very robust flashlight on you, I mean, it doesn't have to be this robust, but just something pretty powerful that you can uh, light paint an object fairly close to you. The truth is that you don't really have to be more than about 30 feet away from any given object for your camera's autofocus to lock on and have you at infinity. So having a good flashlight or even uh, also very, very useful are these laser pointers that you can paint onto an object will give you the opportunity usually to be able to use your camera's autofocus in order to be able to lock on. And I can't remember the number of times in the dark I've inadvertently gone step to the left or the right or backwards and then had one of my great big clodopping feet kick the tripod leg. Wandering through a Walmart one day I had a bit of a brain wave when I came across these. These kind of like glow stick bracelets. But basically what you do is you just take three of them, you crack them and you know form the circle and clasp them together with these little plastic clasps they come with. Put them around each leg of the tripod and let them fall to the ground and right there you've got where your tripod legs are. Now I suppose the question is do they interfere or do they emit enough light to interfere with your shot? The answer is categorically no. So what you can also do is just maybe stick one of these on the back of the uh, on the back of the tripod where your release plate knob is or usually a lot of tripods have hooks underneath them. Well that's a great place to stick one of these so it's up high so if you want to go back to the truck or you want to wander off somewhere else exploring um, it's easily visible. If you do have a lighter weight uh, tripod, what I recommend would be a really good thing to possibly look into grabbing a bunch of these uh, sandbags. Mm, they're pretty cheap, they're about 16 bucks. And obviously they are what they are. You can fill them with sand and you just attach them underneath the tripod, again, to add extra weight and stability. And last but not least, if you are heading off into the darkness and you're getting there around about twilight and there's bags of light for you to see uh, where you're getting down to. Obviously in the dead of night getting back may not be quite so easy. So grabbing a couple of packs of these reflective trail markers uh, is a really good idea and as you can see all you simply do is to you can just clip them onto tree branches or bushes as you make your way down to your location and then once you've finished you've packed up your headlamp is easily going to see these in the dark and you're going to be able to easily find your way back to your vehicle or wherever you happen to be staying. This focuses on camera stability, which is very important when you are doing any form of long exposure photography, albeit during the day or night uh, for astrophotography. And that is uh, getting hold of a cable release. Now, what that's obviously going to do is it will connect to your camera and it'll allow you from a distance to trigger the shutter. So that means that you don't run the risk of uh, touching the camera and possibly introducing slight movement or vibration that could end up showing up in the resulting shot. Now these come in many uh, shapes, sizes and price points. And at, uh, you know, at the very basic level, I mean, you, you're probably looking at something maybe about 10, 12 bucks. Now, as I say, they come in all shapes and sizes. These are just kind of your basic cables. And all you will need to do is make sure that it's compatible with your particular brand and model of camera. They also come in other forms. They can operate and trigger the camera wirelessly. The device I use and have been using for the last couple of years, though, is the Pluto trigger. Now, before I go any further, I just want to make it emphatically clear that I am not in any way affiliated or being paid by Pluto to uh, promote this device, but I found it to be actually quite invaluable. It's a very simple, small, compact uh, unit that can you can either handhold or you can attach to the camera via the flash uh, hot shoe mount. And it connects to the camera through a cable and it's actually triggered via an app on your smartphone. And it's compatible with both Android, uh, iPhone, iOS, and a number of other different models as well. And that's clearly stated on this website. It's very simple. The, the app is, it couldn't be more intuitive. I think it's absolutely great. Now, as I say, it, you can uh, trigger it wirelessly um, through a Bluetooth connection um, from your phone, but alternatively, you can take it off the uh, hot shoe mount and actually hold it in your hand 
and manually trigger it simply by just pressing this button on the top. Here's another tip. If you have your strap attached to the camera, take it off. There are two main reasons why. Firstly, there may be enough of a breeze around that could make the strap start to flap about and start knocking against a tripod leg, the tripod head, or the back of the camera. Over the duration of a long exposure, either during the day or at night, it could create enough vibration that it may end up in the shot, resulting in a softer or even slightly blurred image. Secondly, it's just one more thing under the cloak of darkness and in the dead of night that you could actually catch either with your hand or get wrapped up in that could result in you jolting the tripod and camera, thus moving it out of position or worse, could bring everything crashing to the ground. So, note to self, get your straps off, missus. A raw file is basically an image that preserves most, if not all, of the digital information from the camera sensor and it's what's known as a lossless file, meaning there isn't any compression added. They also use a much bigger color space, such as Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB, which gives one much smoother color and tonal transition, unlike JPEGs, which by comparison, use a much smaller color space, the web standard sRGB color space, which can sometimes lead to noticeable color banding, particularly with subtle color transitions and gradations. JPEGs were created in response to the needs of the internet by being able to create much smaller files that can be easily uploaded or downloaded from the web or sent via email. However, when shooting in JPEG, your camera is automatically adding a bunch of stuff like saturation, sharpening, and a lot of contrast, which is what gives JPEGs their pop. Also, in order to create these much smaller files, it adds a tremendous amount of compression and emits a lot of digital information, thus making it a lot harder to cover things such as blown highlights or open up shadows to reveal more detail. However, raw files will need to be converted to JPEG for printing and sharing. In order to do that, you will need to use a software that can both process and convert raw files to JPEGs such as Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, which comes bundled with Photoshop. Fundamentally, raw files are going to give you much greater latitude in post to make many adjustments that may not be possible with working with JPEGs. This doesn't just apply to astrophotography, but any photography. So I strongly suggest that as you progress as a photographer, you switch to shooting raw, particularly for night and astrophotography. Now let's switch our attention to lenses. Your lens is going to be very important when shooting astro and or night photography. Now this is a very wide and deep topic as there are many lenses out there from which to choose from. The main criteria you may be using is price point and there is a very wide range of prices out there from very expensive through to cheaper lenses. If you are a beginner or are just thinking of trying astrophotography, it's not going to be necessary to spend a vast amount of money as even lenses at the cheaper end of the spectrum can yield very good results. Whether you have a full frame camera or a crop sensor ASPC camera, there will be a number of lenses out there for you to choose from. However, many lenses at the cheaper price point will probably be manual focus only, and having a lens that can also autofocus can be an advantage. So in this section, all I'm going to do is to give you some tips on what it's best to have for night astrophotography. Ideally, what you're gonna want is to have as fast lens as possible. What I mean by fast is it doesn't mean that the lens is going to take pictures any or the camera is going to take pictures uh, any faster than any, any other lens. It simply means that you have a lens that can open up uh, to a very, very wide aperture, thus letting in as much available light in as possible. So looking at this little diagram here, uh, f1.4, uh, what's missing here is f1.8, f2, f2.8. That's kind of the arena that you want to be in. F1.4, F1.8, F2, or F2.8. The reason being is that you, in order to get the, your stars as sharp as possible, you want as fast an exposure as, as possible. Now, as we all know, the stars are constantly in motion above us due to the Earth's rotation. So when you're looking at even possibly a 30 second exposure, and let's just take a quick look here, just zoom in here, even at 30 seconds, you can begin to see uh, some noticeable sort of blurring and elongation of the stars as they're moving across the night sky, as I say, even within 30 seconds. So ideally, you kind of want to be in around sort of between 15 up to 20 
possibly even 25 seconds on your exposure in order to get the stars as sharp as possible. Even the jump between f2.8 to f4, if you're at f4 and you, uh, or f5.6, you're going to have a lot less available light coming into the uh, the camera so in order to offset that you're going to then have to significantly increase your iso setting uh, the only downside to that is uh, if at the higher iso settings you may encounter getting um, a fair degree of luminance and color noise into the shot which is that kind of dark mottled green reddish kind of blotching that uh, <laughs> always lurks around in the darks of the shadow and is synonymous with very low light and night photography. I'm just taking a look at a few out there. Um, this is the uh, lens that I use. It's the Sigma 14 millimeter f1.8. It's uh, 14 millimeter, so it's an ultra wide lens. Now you don't have to go super wide. Uh, something like the uh, Aronkin on 24 millimeter. That's uh, that's a, that's a pretty wide angle lens. But here, this is an even faster lens than the the Sigma. It's uh, f 1.4. The only downfall is, as I said, you know, it's uh, manual focus only. Now, YouTube is also another great resource for kind of trying to figure out what it is you need. There are there are many many uh, videos out there on best lenses and recommendations, etc., etc., etc. So it, you know it's worth uh, checking out YouTube and see what you can get from that. Now, B and H is also a very good resource because they have their true know-how. Ask our experts, and you know they're pretty good. You can either call them or have a live chat conversation. You know, tell them what camera you've got, tell them what you're trying to do. Tell them what your price point is and what features you want. Definitely want to have autofocus or you want to have a really fast lens and they can probably steer you in the right direction. Now, if you are thinking of making the plunge and splashing out a lot of money, but you're still not quite sure, then what I recommend you do is quite simply just rent them. And there are a couple of uh, good resources for that. This is Borrow Lenses. Now, I think the minimum uh, rental period for any given lens is seven days. But for seven days, you, know, you could have you know, a very, very high-end lens. Uh, this is the Nikon 14 to 24. And for seven days, you can rent that for $115. But you can use it, you can field test it, and you can make your mind up as to whether or not, you know, do I really need to splash out this amount of money? Another option is lens rental and the Sigma uh, 14 millimeter 1.8 for seven days is $109. So just to wrap up, very fast lens. That's what you're gonna need. That's gonna be the most important criteria when thinking about choosing a lens for astro and night photography. One of the biggest challenges at night is being able to accurately focus. Now, as we all know, there are two ways to go about it, either autofocus or manual focus. For me personally, whenever possible, I use autofocus. For me, I find it a lot more accurate than trusting my eyes, particularly as I've got older, they've definitely gone from 2020 to maybe 1550 to even 1010. But trying to focus in complete darkness can be difficult, if not impossible at times. So here are a few tips on how to overcome that. I always like to arrive on the scene just around sunset. Now, admittedly, this may not always be possible to do. We all have jobs, family commitments, etc. and may not have the luxury of being able to do that. However, it does have a number of advantages. Usually after official sunset, you're looking at at least an hour of sufficient daylight to accomplish a number of things. Firstly, it will make using your autofocus really easy to get a lock onto the horizon and also make it very easy to set up your shot and composition. Now, I always approach my astrophotography in two stages, firstly the foreground and then the sky. With the sun dropping down behind the horizon, it will allow you to cover off all your foreground shots and be able to take them at much lower ISOs, e.g. 100 or 200, which will result in very clean, noise-free images. You will also have time to take numerous shots at different exposure lengths that you can use in composite to reveal foreground and shadow detail. Once you feel you've got what you need, it's then just a matter of waiting for it to go completely dark and for the stars to be visible in the sky. If you have been focusing on foreground objects close to you, you will probably then need to refocus on more distant objects or the horizon to ensure your star shots will be sharp. With enough available daylight remaining, this shouldn't be very hard to do. The only downside maybe is that depending on what you wish to shoot in the night sky, maybe a particular constellation or the Milky Way, you may have a long wait on your hands before it is risen and or peaked. So you may need to have quite a bit of patience. Now here is a very important tip. If you do use your camera to autofocus, 
Once you've locked on, you must take the camera and or lens back into manual focus, because when the time comes to shoot in total darkness, your camera will focus hunt, then lose focus, and then you'll end up having to start all over again and in the dark. If you're just using manual focus, you won't have to worry about that. Another way is, before you leave or at some point during the day, point your camera at a distant object or the horizon, autofocus and put it back into manual focus. That way you know you're at infinity, which will result in sharp focus in the sky. However, you may run the risk of either accidentally touching or bumping the focus ring in transit. So before you leave, carefully put a couple of pieces of, say, gaffer tape on the focus ring and along the body of the lens, which will hold it in place. If you are leaving in the dark, always look for lights en route, albeit street lights, distant houses with lights on, car lights, and use these to autofocus on before you reach your destination. But just make sure not to bump that focus ring. So if you can, get it taped down and switch back to manual focus. I would not recommend using the infinity symbol on your lens because this may not be very accurate as, depending on your lens, sharp infinity focus may be just before or just after the center mark of the infinity symbol on the lens. As I mentioned earlier, having a powerful flashlight or a laser pointer with you can be very effective in allowing you to throw a beam of light onto a distant object and use it to lock on autofocus or manual focusing by being in live view and zooming in on the camera's rear LCD screen. This also ties into the importance sometimes of reconning the location before you get there on a previous day or night so you can get a sense of what's around you. For example, if you're fairly close to the road, there may be reflective road signs in the distance you could use, or guardrail reflectors, or the oncoming headlights of a car. Alternatively, instead of throwing light out, consider having a spare headlamp with you that you can place somewhere at a fair distance in front of you and use the light from that. Cheap bicycle lights can also be useful in order to do this, which you can maybe clip to a small tree branch or place somewhere you can see it and focus on it. All of these techniques I've used and done in the past with great success. Another challenge when having arrived in the dark is image composition. That is, being able to clearly see what it is you're shooting and the proportional relationship between the sky and the foreground, etc. Even after your eyes have readjusted to the dark, this can sometimes still be a challenge. You may be faced with taking multiple shots at rather lengthy exposure times, which can be very time consuming. Overcoming this is very easy. Simply crank your ISO up as far as it will go. And naturally, when shooting wide open with your lens, you may need nothing more than like maybe a one, two, three second exposure for you to clearly see on your rear LCD screen the shot you've just taken and how it's doing in terms of the overall composition of the shot, allowing you to quickly and easily make whatever adjustments you need. The resulting image will obviously be ghastly, but it is only for image composition reference purposes. You can just repeat this until you've got it just where you need it to be, then it's just a matter of reducing your ISO back down to an appropriate level and increasing the exposure time for an optimal exposure. It's a very quick and easy way of dialing in your composition in the dark. Now before we go any further, I'd just like to give you a heads up on a particular technique I've used now for many years, and that's luminosity masking. Now this tutorial is not meant to go in depth on what they are, etc. And for the last few years, I've used the TK Actions panel, created and developed by Tony Kuiper. It's a very powerful and sophisticated actions panel that automates many of the tasks we do in Photoshop on a regular basis. And it's very useful in terms of speeding up and streamlining one's workflow. It's also very powerful as it can automatically generate channels and masks based on luminosity values in any given image, from the lights through to the midtones and darks. Now, there's nothing more frustrating than having got this far only to then find out I'm using some fancy schmancy plugin that you don't have and have no understanding of. So in this tutorial, I won't be using it. There are a number of tutorials out there on how it works and how it can be used that you can check out if you feel it's maybe of interest to you. However, prior to using the TK Actions panel, I had created some basic action sets that simply generate all the necessary luminosity channels, from which I can then create custom masks that can then be used in conjunction with adjustment layers for very accurate and targeted adjustments. Well, you're probably thinking, great, I don't have those either. Well, yes you do, or you can as I have created a download link via Dropbox where you can download them and load them into your actions panel and use them. So first of all, let's take a look at my approach to the image composition. 
Now I approach all my night astro landscape photography just as I do any daylight shots. For me, putting all the post-processing bells and whistles and subject matters to one side, the ultimate quality of any image is going to begin and end with its composition. Having a well thought out and considered composition is going to result in a much better balanced, aesthetically pleasing and engaging image. Now as we all know there are a number of rules out there, the most common being the rule of thirds, the use of leading lines and diagonals etc that will help to steer the viewer through the shot. Now basically how I define composition is simply the organisation of the elements in the shot and their relationships to one another. To start I usually try to find good foreground anchor objects like these rocks that also start to lead the viewer into the shot. Then I consider what my midground elements are and finally the background elements. Now in this shot I wanted to use the curve of the ice to act as the leading line. Then use the perspective diagonal of the bank to lead the viewer to the horizon and sky. In order to quickly get a sense of the composition I applied the technique I mentioned earlier and shooting wide open at f1.8 I cranked the ISO up to 25,000 and only needed a one second exposure to sufficiently see the scene on my back screen and dial in the composition to where I wanted it to be. Now this image may look a little bit misleading as the light on the horizon is not the sun but light coming up from a distant village. The reality was that it didn't give enough contrast against the horizon so I wasn't able to lock focus on. But having shot there many times before I knew that at some point a car would appear on the road that loops around the reservoir and because it's so dark they usually had their high beams on. And sure enough a car soon appeared on the left bank, I was able to track its lights and have my autofocus lock on which gave me sharp focus on the horizon. Once locked on I took the lens back into manual focus before starting the shoot to avoid it focus hunting if left in autofocus. However because it was at f1.8 it meant I had a very shallow depth of field which meant that although the horizon was sharp the rocks nearest to the camera were soft and out of focus. So once having got the horizon and the star shots I needed, I simply light painted the foreground rocks with my headlight and refocused on them so that they were sharp and took a number of shots at different exposure lengths. So now I'll begin my uh, post-processing workflow. These are the two images that I have selected in order to uh, demonstrate my post-processing workflow. The first one being a 30 second exposure at f1.8 and an ISO of 500. And this second longer exposure which is the uh, same aperture f1.8 but 143 seconds. And this was the exposure where I uh, used my headlamp to shine onto these foreground rocks in order to refocus to offset the fact that I was shooting at f1.8 in such a uh, shallow depth of field. So I'm just going to select these two images, double click and bring them up into Adobe Camera Raw. Now I'm just going to shift click on these two images in order to select both and come up and make a uh, couple of um, very important uh, adjustments by coming over to the Lens Correction tab here and clicking on Remove Chromatic Aberration and Enable Profile Corrections. Now what this does, it detects the metadata uh, in this RAW file and has detected I'm using my Cigna 14mm f1.8 and it'll adjust the image uh, to offset any barrel distortion that may be in here uh, as a result of using such a wide angle lens and also it will remove any inherent vignetting that has happened as a result. These however are two features you will not be able to uh, use or do if you are shooting in JPEG. It only works if you are using RAW files. So another good reason why, you know, as I say, I recommend shooting in RAW. I'm just going to come back to my main adjustments tab. I'm going to unclick just to select the dark one and I'm just going to possibly bring up the exposure just a tad and bring up the shadows a bit doesn't need much because obviously this is my darker shot but just maybe bring up the blacks a little bit now with the lighter shot my point earlier about you know trying to keep the exposure as short as possible at 143 seconds you can see the amount of blurring um, that's occurred to these stars um, as they've been moving across the sky within the duration of that uh, exposure so just come on zero just to put that back into the window and here I think what I'm going to do I am going to bring up the exposure quite a bit and doesn't have to be too much now I just want to make a really important point and it's good to be able to see both this dark and lighter one the mere physicalities it doesn't matter whether you're shooting during the day 
or shooting at night, your foreground is never going to be at the same exposure value as the as your sky. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, even in this shot here, you know, it is much darker down here as opposed to the brightness of the sky. And this is the thing that you have to be very careful of. Um, particularly with astro night photography is is striking a really good a comfortable balance between the level of the exposure of your foreground as opposed to the exposure of the sky because so often i see so many astro landscape shots where it looks like the foreground has almost been shot in daylight and it they just look really weird and phony and and basically just a bit naff so again that's something to uh, take on board and remember when you are trying to do these composites that your foreground is never going to be at the same exposure value as the sky your sky is always going to be brighter it doesn't always have to be you know by it much but you know as i say they should never be on the same uh, exposure value level right so i think we're probably good here may just pull these shadows a tad more just to open these up a bit and at iso 500 i still have a very very clean shot and these uh, rocks are really sharp so i'm happy with that and what i'm now just going to do is click on done to accept that you can see these uh, small icons up in the top right. That now indicates that these have uh, had settings applied to them. From here on in, with these two files still selected, I'm just going to come up onto Tools, come down to Photoshop, and select Load Files into Photoshop Layers. And this is something you can also do in Lightroom. So here we are now uh, in Photoshop, and you can see I have a bunch of panels over here open up on the stage. I have my layers panel, my histogram, and also have the histogram and expanded view in terms of all channels view, so that I can see the red, green, blue channel. I have my info panel and my properties panel for adjustment layers, the channels panel, and my actions panel here. Now what I want to do is I actually want to swap the uh, the stacking order of these two layers. So what I'm going to do is just click and I want to bring the darker one underneath the lighter one. Now because I'd refocus there may have been a bit of focus breathing going on here in terms of a slight the slight movement of this image as opposed to this one. So in order to make sure these are perfectly aligned I'm just going to shift shift click on both layers and come up under edit and come down to auto align layers. When this dialog box comes up, I'm just going to leave it selected at auto and press OK. So yeah, I mean, this is a really good way. I mean, it's very, very accurate. And what this has now done has brought these into um, complete alignment. Uh, so when I come to start blending one layer into another, um, there shouldn't be any noticeable shifting of the image. My first goal is to create a custom channel that is going to allow me to create masks that separate both the foreground and these trees from the sky. Now, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to my channels panel, click on the composite RGB, and begin to look at which of the red, green, and blue channels is going to offer me sufficient contrast between the darks of the uh, foreground and this tree line here and the sky. Now, it looks to me like it's going to be the blue one, so what I'm going to do is select the blue uh, channel and right-click and select Duplicate Channel. Now I'm going to now name this as Sky and click OK. And as you can see, it's created a new a duplicate channel. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, go Command or if you're on a PC, Control L to bring up my levels. Now from the levels, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make some very aggressive changes. I'm going to uh, take the white point slider here over on the right and drag it across towards the left. And then similarly, I'm just going to go and grab the black point slider here on the left and bring that over to the right. And you can see what's happening is adding a tremendous amount of separation between that horizon and the foreground. So that's looking pretty good. I'm going to click OK to accept that. And now it's, all it's a question of doing, I'm just going to select my marquee tool and just drag across the horizon here. I uh, better not do that. It's actually a little bit too close. OK, so what I'll do, I'll just start off by dragging here so I miss the top of that horizon. And with this uh, selection now active, I'm simply going to come up under Edit, down to Fill, and change the content over to Black so that it neatly fills that. And I'm just going to zoom in. And now what I think I'll do is I'll just select my uh, Polygon Lasso tool and just draw some lines in here very carefully into here out here out here and close out that path to make a selection back up to edit fill 
blacks all selected. So I'll just let command D to select. And then up here, I think what are, yeah, done. Mm, yeah, I think I'll cover these, uh, this little white area here. Same thing, edit fill, fill with black. And I'm just gonna zero in up here and just get rid of these little guys here. And then what I think I'll do is just hold down the shift key so I can make another selection just carefully, just catch this, these little white spots here. Close that out, make a selection, same over here. And as I say, I'm just holding down the shift key to make multiple selections. Close that out, yeah, on, there we go. Zoom out a bit. And then again, it's just a case of coming up under edit and going fill. Great, Command D to deselect. Now what I wanna do is create the foreground channel. Um, it's basically just a question of inverting this channel. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up to the sky uh, channel and duplicate this channel. I'm going to call this foreground. And down here there's a button um, that I can click to invert it. So I'm going to select that and click OK. And that's basically what it's done. It's now inverted that channel so that uh, Everything that was black is white and now vice versa. And these are the two channels now I can use in order to create um, masks on which to attach the adjustment layers for further development. So let me quickly explain the basic concept of masking in Photoshop. Masking is controlled by simply by two colors, black and white. And the mantra is that white reveals and black conceals. And let me demonstrate that. With this uppermost layer selected, I'm just gonna come down to the bottom of the layers panel and click on the small rectangular icon with a hole in it, which is the add new layer mask icon. By clicking on it, it automatically attaches a white mask to it. Now, because it's white and white reveals black conceals, this mask is now allowing this layer to show in its entirety on the stage. However, if I click on this mask to target it and press Command or Control I, it inverts it and it makes it black. And so as a consequence, black is now concealing this layer, so in actuality hiding it. So let me just click on this again and go Command I again to invert it and you'll get the point. White reveals, black conceals. White reveals, black conceals. And that is the basic premise of concept of masking in Photoshop. Now, let me just right click on this mask and select delete it. And now what I wanna do is apply a mask to this layer that is only going to reveal this foreground. And in order to do that, I'm just going to um, select the foreground channel. And I'm simply just gonna press command or control and click on it. And in doing so, you see these marching ends indicating that it has actually made a selection. So with this selection in place, it's simply a question of coming back down to my add new layer mask icon down here, clicking it, and that's what it's done. It created a mask that allows this brighter foreground to show through while concealing the dark of the sky. Now, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> This looks completely wrong and it looks completely phony. There's no way that this foreground should be this bright. So what I'm going to start to do is just simply to reduce the opacity of this layer mask to start dialing it back. I'm going to take it all the way down and then just start dragging to begin to get a really good balance there between the sky and the foreground. And I think at around about 45%, that's doing a pretty good job. So let me just shift click on this layer mask in order to disable it. And as I say, it disables the mask and you can see that without that mask, this is how the sky would look. I'm just gonna shift click on it again to re-enable it. And as I say, this black, it's just option click, the black of this mask is concealing that sky and only allowing the foreground to show through. Next on the agenda is that I want to add a couple of control points to uh, the, the brightest areas and the darkest areas of this image. Now, this is important um, because it's a really great way to uh, do any necessary color correction. 
and it all keys off of the uh, values of the red, green, and blue channel. Now, the hist your histogram is obviously going to be really important. And basically, what this is is a graphical representation of the darkness and brightness values within any given image. On the left is all your darks and shadows. The middle, not surprisingly, is the midtones. And on the far right here is your brights, whites, and highlights. Now, these are calculated in numbers. On the left, it will be zero, which is represented as solid black. On the extreme right, it will be represented as 255, which is solid white. And in the middle, it's uh, around about 127, which is kind of half of uh, 255. Now, in Lightroom, I believe that those are represented as percentages. So on the left, a solid black would be 0%. Uh, Midtones would be 50% and brights and highlights would be 100%. But now what I want to do is add a couple of control points to see what the color balance is across these three uh, color channels. So in order to do that, I'm going to come down to the half and half cookie um, icon at the bottom of the layers panel, click and add a threshold layer. But this is a very useful and simple uh, adjustment layer because all it really does is just show you blacks and whites. Now I want to find the brightest spot in this image. Now I'm going to bring this slider all the way over from the middle, which is its default position to the far right, and begin to pull back towards the left to see where the bright spots are starting to appear. Now I'm not concerned about the stars showing up. I want to get a part of the sky, the brightest part of the sky. And it looks to me like it's going to be around here. So now what I'm going to do is just uh, tap my I key to bring up the eyedropper tool. Hover over this white area here, and before clicking, I'm going to hold down the Shift key, and a little icon appears, and I'm just going to click. And that's added a control point. Now, this is for my highlights. I'm now going to do the same for my darks and shadows. I'm going to bring the slider all the way over to the left, and begin, begin to slide it incrementally over to the right to see where the dark spots are happening. I don't have to go too far, obviously. It looks like it's kind of in down in around here, right in the darks of the shadows. Same thing with my eyedropper tool selected. I'm just going to hover over this dark area and hold down the shift key and click. And that's now added a second control point. The job of the threshold layer is now done and I can just simply delete it. Now what it's a question of doing is just analyzing and looking in the info panel the numbers that it's giving me across the red, green and blue channels. Red it's at 178. Green, it's at 162, and blue, it's 137. Now, with these higher numbers, particularly the red being at 178 in comparison to 137 of the blue, it's now clearly telling me that I have a lot more red in this image. And I can tell that by looking at, you know, just in these clouds and particularly down in these rocks, I tend to have a little bit of a uh, kind of a, a pinkish, mauveish color cast that I can now begin to neutralize. Now, in order to do that, I'm simply going to come down and add a curves adjustment layer. And I'm going to switch the RGB view over to the red channel. And I'm simply going to just click on the node at the top here and begin to bring it down. And I'm going to start looking at those numbers and they are starting to reduce, thus indicating that I'm taking that red out of the image. And then it's just really a question of doing it to taste. So I think maybe down to around here. Another way to do it far more incrementally is just select that node. And then just by tapping the down arrow of my keyboard, I shall now start reducing that red in there. So I'll probably bring it down to around about 170. A little bit more. Yeah, and that's done a really great job of neutralizing that red color cast in the shot. And just take a quick look by toggling the layer on and off. And yeah, it's just added, uh, it's just cooled it off and uh, made it a little bit more naturalistic in terms of its feel. Now, although I feel I have a, a pretty decent balance between the sky and the foreground tonally, I'm starting to feel that uh, the image overall is a little on the flat side. So what I'm gonna do now is to add some contrast adjustments. And in order to do that, I am actually going to come up to my uh, Customs Luminosity Actions panel here and run the mid channels. And this is going to give me mids uh, 1 through 5. 
I think what I'm going to do is select the mid three and make a selection in order to do that. Again, you have two options in, in order to be able to do that. You can either come down to this dotted circle here, click that and it will make a selection. Just go Command D to deselect that. Or as I say, it's simply a question of hovering over the, uh, the channel and holding down the uh, Command or Control key and clicking. And that also makes a selection. Now, for me personally, I don't use this fly out menu down here to uh, add adjustment layers. So what I normally do is just bring up the adjustments panel. And this is basically the same thing. It allows you to add adjustment layers, but they're represented in icon form. It just obviously just takes a little bit of time uh, just to figure out and remember which one represents what. But right now what I want to do is I want to add a levels adjustment layer. And this red has appeared because the mask is turned on in the channels. Now after creating this uh, adjustment layer mask, now what I want to do is come and delete all these uh, channels, these mids channels. The reason being is that within each of these channels, one through five, there's about as much digital information as is exists in the composite RGB. And pretty quickly, um, if you start adding a lot of these and uh, you forget to delete them, you're going to find that your file size is going to uh, go through the roof. And you could be in a situation whereby, unless you're not completely ramped up with RAM and goodness knows what else, you might tend to find Photoshop slowing down and or at worst could even begin to start crashing. So once I've made a selection, once I've made this uh, uh, mid three selection. I'm now just going to click the delete button to get rid of those, thus keeping my uh, image size down. Now with the levels adjustment layer selected, I'm now going to come down to the properties panel here and just start dragging down on the midtones just to darken those down. Start to get quite a bit more contrast back in there. And probably what I'll do is I'll just shift the white point slider over to the left a little bit just to dial in a little bit more contrast. And I think that's looking pretty good. I may bring in the, the black point a tad. Be careful that my shadows and darks don't start filling in and going to um, solid black. So yeah, that looks kind of good. So let me just toggle this on and off to see that adjustment. And all I'm doing here is just clicking on the little eyeball icon to the left, just to switch that on and off. But I think I am losing a little bit of detail down here in the foreground. So what I'm going to do is come down to my foregrounds channel and control click on it to make a selection. Switch to my layers panel and, and instantiate a brightness contrast. And I'm just gonna come down to the brightness slider and just lift that up just a little bit, just to bring in a little bit more detail into that foreground. But again, you know, it's always a balance understanding that light is naturally ramping off from the horizon down to the foreground. So again, you know, you don't wanna kind of overcook it so it begins to start to look weird. Right, so I'm pretty pleased with the way this is shaping up. Now what I'm gonna do is create a channel that I'm gonna be able to create a mask from that is just gonna target the stars and allow me to bring a little bit more punch and presence of those stars in the night sky. Now in order to do that, I'm going to run my lights channels and it would be simply a question of selecting the lights one. Now, if you don't want to have these actions and you don't want to go through this palaver, whatever, I'm just going to delete these because the light one channel is the easiest channel to manually create. All you need to simply do is select the RGB composite uh, channel at the top here and then hold down the control key and click on it. And that makes the lights one selection. Now it's just a question of coming down and saving that as a channel. Now, by default, it calls it alpha. And so I'm just gonna rename this and call it stars. I'm going to press Command D to deselect. Now what I wanna do is create a tremendous amount of contrast, really crush the blacks and bring up the, uh, the, the highlights and the white point just to target these stars. So again, with this channel selected, I'm just gonna do Command or Control L to bring up my levels. I'm just gonna bring over the black point slider to the right to really crush down those blacks, right to maybe the middle. And then consequently, I will also then bring the white point over to the left to really kind of dial up the contrast of those stars. Click OK to accept that. Now all I do is just tap my L key to bring up my polygon lasso tool and just quickly draw a path around these white areas that I don't need, close out that path, 
and then edit fill make sure it's set to black command d to deselect let's zoom out a little bit now what i'm going to do is make a selection from this channel simply by command or control clicking on it to make that selection i'm now going to add a levels adjustment layer i'll turn off this mask and just go in a little bit and what i'm going to do is switch this layer's blending mode over from normal to screen and that just gives a just a fraction more punch into the stars in the sky. Now, if I shift click on this mask to disable it, you'll see what's happened. The uh, screen blending mode has lightened everything. And then this mask has just hidden everything, but just allowed the adjustment to affect the stars in the sky. Now, what I want to do is to add a little bit of darkening down here at the top of the sky, just to ramp it off. Also, it kind of give the uh, illusion of having an ND grad filter on the shot here. So in order to do that, I'm simply going to select the uppermost layer here and just add another levels adjustment layer. And I'm going to switch its blending mode over from normal to, well, multiply. And that's obviously going to darken everything down significantly. That's way too aggressive. So I'm simply going to click on this mask and press Command or Control I to invert it. So it hides that adjustment. Now what I'm going to do is tap the G key to bring up my gradation tool. And what you want to make sure uh, in terms of the preset is to make sure that the gradation is going from white to transparent, not white to black, white to transparent. Now I want to set the uh, gradations blend to uh, 50% so it's a little bit more subtle and what I'm going to do is target the layer mask and I'm going to just click at the top of the image here, hold down my shift key to constrain it vertically, just pull down and then release and you can see what's happened. What's happened is that the gradation has gone is going from kind of like white down to black and it's ramping off, thus giving the illusion of that gradation. So let me just toggle that on and off. And I think that's looking pretty good. However, what's happened is that that uh, multiply blend mode has kind of dulled some of the stars out down here. So I want to add another layer mask to this in order to just protect those from that adjustment. In order to do that, I'm going to come down to the stars channel and uh, right click and go duplicate channel. I'm just going to uh, leave the name as copy and click invert. So now what that's created is the opposite. And in here, if I just zoom in, you can see all those little tiny white stars are now black. Just click on the RGB composite. Now what I want to do is what's called group masking. Um, once you've instantiated a layer mask onto an adjustment layer, if you go down and try and add another mask to that particular layer, it adds what's known as a vector mask. And those behave very differently from regular uh, layer masks. So let me just delete that. Yes, please. Right. So now what I'm going to do is what's known or what I call group masking. I'm now going to put this layer into a container by simply uh, pressing uh, command or control, control G. And now let's put that into a group. Now all it's a case of doing is adding a layer mask to the, the container, the group layer. So in order to do that, I'm just going to come down to this channel and control or command click. Come back to the RGB, target this group uh, layer and then just add a layer mask. And once that's done, if I just disable it, it's just very, very subtly. It's protected this layer mask from showing through. So those tiny little black dots are preventing this adjustment layer from showing through, thus protecting the stars from that gradation adjustment. It's very subtle, but it's there, trust me. I'll just toggle that on and off, and there's the gradation. Now I want to do the same thing. I want to perhaps, I think maybe I just want to pull in, pull in this left edge a little bit, just darken it down just to kind of uh, help focus a little bit more uh, on the midpoint here. It's kind of tending to drift away a little bit. So again, what I'm going to do is add a levels adjustment layer. I'm going to switch its blending mode over to multiply, invert that layer mask, and I'm going to grab my um, gradation tool again by tapping the G key and I'm going to click and I'm going to um, drag horizontally holding down the shift key to constrain that maybe to about there 
and there that's kind of darkened that down and pulled that in. Might be a little bit aggressive. So what I'm going to do is just simply reduce the opacity of that layer just to dial it back a fraction. I think maybe uh, around about there as well. Now I'm just wondering if I might want to do the same down at the bottom here just to kind of get you know a little bit of dark ramping up there. A levels adjustment layer. It's blending mode over from normal to multiply. Going to target the layer mask, command or control I to invert it. I'm going to come down to the bottom edge of this image and just click and hold down the shift key, drag up and release. And again, that may be a little bit too aggressive. So I'm just going to dial it down to zero and just incrementally start increasing its opacity just to gently darken down this bottom edge. And from here, it's just really a balance of looking at reducing the opacity of these layers to get a nice even balance. I just back this off a fraction, bring a little bit more detail in there. And the side, I might back this off a little bit. It's a 74%. I'm just going to back that off a fraction in there. So yeah, so I think that's looking pretty good. Now what I want to do is uh, what's called dodging and burning. I want to target and isolate certain uh, elements within the shot just to give them a little bit more punch. All I'm going to do is add a, another levels adjustment layer and switch its blending mode over to screen. And that obviously brightens everything. And I'm now going to press Command I or Control I to invert that to hide it. And then I'm going to tap my B key to bring up my brush. And what you can do in terms of opacity, um, you can use your um, numerical keyboard to change the uh, opacity by increments of 10. So if I tap the number one key, it now makes the opacity of this brush 10%. And then if I tap two, it makes it 20. And if I tap three, it makes it 30, etc., etc. And then zero brings it back to 100%. Now I'm gonna tap my one key to make the opacity 10%. And to the right of the P key, you will see a left and square bracket. Tapping on the left bracket will reduce the size of the brush and then tapping on the right bracket will increase the size of the brush. So I just want to reduce this down and I want to make sure that the brush is loaded with uh, white paint in order to start very, very subtly revealing just, I need to go a little bit smaller, I just want to bring out the highlights of that rock there. I want to go really small, I just want to punch a little bit that star that's reflecting in the water there and then maybe just come up and just do a little bit of lightning in here. Maybe just bring the detail of these trees out fractionally. Again, understanding that these are naturally going to be in shadow because the light is coming from behind them. So there's no real need for me to want to have to deal with dial those up. And maybe just bring a little bit more presence of this rock down here. So yeah, I think that's looking pretty good. So I'll just toggle on that layer on and off so you can just see the small subtle changes that that's brought. Might gone a little bit heavy here near the rocks, so I'm just going to tap down and then tap the X key to load to toggle the uh, background to foreground so that this uh, brush is now filled with black. And I'm just going to start ghosting that back a little bit so there's no kind of overspill from the lightning of that highlight. And maybe a little bit on the rock as well. I'm not too keen on this lightning of this area of the. Uh, snow here, or the ice rather, so I'm just going to tap zero to bring that, that to 4% and just cover that mask and conceal it by painting black onto it. Now it's a question of just toggling, on. yeah I'm pretty happy with that. Now whenever I'm working on a, an image in terms of post-processing I always set the timer on my phone for around about 15 minutes because I think it's important that uh, at some point to take a break, get away from the blue light and let your eyes readjust. So as soon as my phone goes off, that's it, I'll go away, you know, make a cup of coffee or do whatever, just to let my eyes readjust. And then when coming back, it gives me, as I say, fresher eyes just to begin to make more uh, judgment calls on the image in general. And right now, I think what I want to do, I do want to bring a little bit more contrast or darkness down into the sky, just give it a little bit more drama. So in order to do that, I'm simply going to come to my sky channel here and I'm going to control or command click on it. And then I'm going to come up and just add another uh, levels adjustment layer and turn off its uh, mask and I'm going to come down to I think the midpoint and just 
bring that down a touch yeah i think that's that's adding a little bit more drama to it and again obviously this this uh, the black of this mask is protecting the foreground area so it's not affecting it so that's pretty good um also worth bearing in mind that as soon as you do start making contrast adjustments uh, it is going to uh, tend to boost saturation so i think it's starting to get a little bit too blue for my liking so i'm going to add a uh, hue saturation layer and I'm going to come down to the master dialog box and just switch that over to blues. And I'm just going to, in terms of the saturation, uh, double click to select it. I'm going to hold down my shift key and then tap my down arrow key. And that's going to dial it back by uh, about 10, minus 10. And I think that's just done enough to, and again, I can notice it here in the midground as well. It's just taken the edge off that blue color cast and saturation. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with this. I think uh, I'm ready to do the last phase. And this is something you should always do at, your, at the end of the workflow process, and that is sharpening. Now, there are a number of ways to apply sharpening to an image, either in Adobe Lightroom, Adobe Camera Raw, and Photoshop. And I'm going to share with you uh, the technique that I use, that I have used uh, for many years now. And sharpening should be always done as the last part of the workflow process and at both the resolution and size that you are eventually going to be outputting it to. Now, before I do, I'm going to duplicate this file simply by coming up under image and come down to duplicate. And it's going to say save as workflow copy. I'm just going to change that to workflow underscore SFW. So that's note to self that this is now going to be sharpened for web and click OK. Now what I'm going to do is to flatten this in terms of flatten down all these layers. So I just have one layer in my layers panel and to do that just come to the little fly up menu up here and just select flatten image great so now i'm left with just one composite layer of that image and what i want to do is i want to um, change this image size uh, for the web so i want to take its uh, ppi down from 300 to the web standard of 72 ppi and i want to probably give it a height of around about let's say i don't know 1500 pixels so in order to do that i'm just going to come up under image come down to image size now the first thing i want to do is to change the resolution over from 300 to 72 ppi and now i want to adjust the height reduce the height down to 1500 pixels making sure that the ch chain icon here is active so that it will constrain the width as well in unison so I'll just hit OK and obviously made it considerably smaller. So I'll just uh, control hit the plus key just to bring that up. Doesn't need to be that big. Uh, that's probably fine for now. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to command or control J on this layer to duplicate it. I am actually going to get this out of the way so I can see everything a little bit more clearly. And with this uh, layer selected, I am now going to come up to filter, come down to other. And I'm going to select high pass. Now this is going to turn it uh, completely great. And what's actually going on here is the algorithm of the high pass filter is basically an edge detection algorithm. It's it detecting uh, all of the edges that are actually contained within this uh, image, particular image. Now right now it's set to a pixel radius of 0.1. I'm going to make it uh, uh, one pixel. And I'm seeing that I'm starting to see quite aggressive um, edge detection going on up here. So I think I'm going to back that off to, say, 0.5. We'll start at 0.5. So now all it's a case of doing is, with this layer selected, is to experiment with switching its blending mode over. You can do um, overlay. And it, you can start to see if I just toggle this on and off. You see the stars there? They're already starting to pop. But for me, the my favorite, it tends to work the best, is Vivid Light. So I'm going to change that over to Vivid Light. And yeah, so if I just toggle that on and off, you can see it's added quite a lot more pop and sharpening. Now, if this is still too aggressive, I may want to just bring the um, opacity of this layer down. So it's to zero and just increase it. I don't know, probably around about maybe I think 50% is good enough. I don't want to get too aggressive with the sharpening and certainly for me um, what I don't do is to globally sharpen an image I want to make targeted selective sharpening of certain key areas now the first thing that I want to uh, obviously make sure that's uh, pretty well dialed in are the stars so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to the stars uh, channel 
Control or Command click on it to make a selection, come up to the high pass filter layer and just simply add a layer mask. So what that's basically done is just constrained that sharpening just to the stars. Just a little bit more pop when I toggle that on and off. Now it's just simply a case of making localized uh, sharpening uh, by simply uh, bringing up my brush by tapping the B key. And that's pretty big, so I'll just tap my left bracket, uh, square bracket key. And I've got the brushes uh, filled with white. I have it at an opacity of 100. And now I'm just going to just get back in it. Uh, it's one of those, there, there we go, that's okay. Right, and I'm just gonna kind of look at it and I think the things that are closer to the camera are gonna probably be a little bit more sharp than uh, those on the distant horizon. So I'm literally just going to start painting onto that black mask to reveal the sharpening just in certain localized areas. So I wanna just bring these foreground rocks up a little bit. I'm going to reduce my brush. I just want to catch the edge of uh, this ice here, just to give that just a little bit more definition. And also the highlights on this rock, just want to give those a little bit of a pop, and maybe this star down here in the foreground. Um, let's have a look at these trees. Do they need anything, maybe? I'm just going to maybe just tap on those to just bring out a little bit more detail. The reason why I don't is because any form of sharpening algorithm, as I say, it's basically micro contrast. So what you may tend to find happen, particularly with very low light images, there may be an inherent grain in the shot. I mean, whether or not, you know, particularly if it's a slightly noisier shot, and all sharpening is going to do is to exacerbate that and make that a lot more visible within the shot. So for me, as I say, localizing the sharpening tends to work a lot better. I don't want to sharpen these trees because I'm a little bit worried of them starting to get all kind of a bit gnarly and crunchy and, and basically I don't really think they need them. So I'm just going to Command Z to undo that. And there we are. Now I'm noticing one other thing. I think it's a small house just here. There's a little light there that I'm finding a bit distracting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just click off that and I'm going to make a stamp layer which is basically going to be a composite of these two layers on top. And in order to do that you need three modifier keys. That's uh, Command, Option, Shift. On a PC that will be uh, Control, Alt, Shift and then just tap the E key. And that's made a composite of these two layers together. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to Bring down, I'm going to tap the L key to bring over, to bring up my, actually, you know what? I think I'll make the lasso tool just the regular. I'm just going to draw around that little light there. And with the selection uh, active, I'm just going to come up to edit, come down to fill. And I'm going to switch the fill mode from black over to content aware. And that's going to analyze what's around that little white dot and fill it in and command D to deselect and yep sure enough it's gone. I am now going to make this a JPEG in order to do that I'm going to come up under file and select save as Photoshop PSD file to a JPEG and I'm just going to hit save. Have the format options on baseline standard and quality maximum and just hit OK. Now I have a nice smallish JPEG file that I can now share with the world. Well, that completes this tutorial. Before I finally say adieu, I hope you found it informative and of use. But if you do have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section. I would simply like to say thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Ciao for now.